Christian Rob McGregor welcome you to a place where all kinds of phenomena flourish. Voices whisper, ancient secrets, signs and symbols are abundant. UFOs, ETs, ghosts, and even the dead move about freely. Here we meet authors, researchers, and investigators of the mysterious, the strange, and of the inexplicable anomalies that surround us. Step out of the everyday world and take a journey into the mystical underground. Welcome to the Mystical Underground. Thank you for joining us. This is Trish McGregor and Rob McGregor and our producer and tech magician, John Posey. He's a disembodied voice there, Mark. You can go to the mysticalunderground.com where we make regular blog posts and where you can find out about the, uh, our books. Among them are Phenomena, Harnessing Your Psychic Abilities, The Secrets of Spirit Communication, Sensing the Future and Aliens in the Backyard. Our latest book is Mind-Blowing Synchronicities, the latest science, stories, and research. Trisha's most recent novel, It's White Crows and Rob's, is called Tulpas. If you're, watch, uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, we would appreciate if you would take a second to click the like, subscribe, and notification buttons so you never miss an episode. Please subscribe there. If you would like to have your astrology chart done to get a sense of how 2025 will unfold for you, send me an email through the contact tab on the mysticalunderground.com. Okay, our guest today is Marcus Anthony. He's a, an associate uh, professor who teaches futures studies at the College for Global Talents, which <clears throat> is part of the Beijing Institute of Technology. He is a futurist, a life coach, and a writer. He investigates deep futures, profound, meaningful, and sustainable visions of tomorrow. Some of the specific futures that Dr. Anthony focuses on include human and artificial intelligence, mindfulness, technology, technology in the future, and consciousness studies. He is the author of Power and Presence, his new book, uh, Reclaiming Your, uh, Your Authentic Self in a Digital World, and... Uh, about 10, no, actually more like 12 years ago, uh, he wrote his first book, which we, I remember interviewing him for our blog. Uh, it was called uh, Discover Your Soul Template, 14 Steps for Awakening Integrated Intelligence. He lives in the city of Zhuhi in China, in southern China. Did I pronounce that right, Marcus? Juhai, Juhai. Juhai. Okay, all right. So we, we met Marcus, as I said, 12 or 13 years ago when he came on our Synchronicity blog when we were writing a book at the time, or when he was writing a book at the time that uh, uh, he, he originally called it The Sage of Synchronicity, and that became uh, Discover Your Soul Template. Uh, so we record, we re corresponded with him uh over the years, uh, until we moved it, uh, from Australia into China, then we sort of lost touch for a while. But it's great to mm -hmm. great to be back in touch. Welcome, Marcus. Uh, thanks, Rob and, and Trish for inviting me. Uh, it's been a while. Um, I do recall a few years ago that we were more in touch then. So yeah, um, yeah I guess it corresponded with my moving to China. I guess <laughs> right, it kind of did. How, you know, how do you like living in China? I like I like living in China. Yeah. Do you? Mm -hmm. I remember you moved to New Zealand first, didn't you, before China? Yeah, I was in New Zealand. Um, up, well, it's a long time ago now, up to about 1999 I left. Yeah, then I wow. went to went to uh, live in Taiwan for two and a half years, okay. and then to uh, mainland China after that. Okay. where uh, So yeah. you, you're originally from uh, Australia then? Where in Australia? That's right, yeah. Yeah, I was in Australia until I was 30, and then I went to New Zealand, and then over here to uh, to Asia. I've been back to Australia once, once or twice to to live, but uh, basically I've been living in uh, the Greater China region, including Hong Kong as well, since uh, nineteen late nineteen ninety nine. So twenty five years. Yeah. Wow. So you probably you probably speak Mandarin then, right? Yeah, not too bad. I mean, I would like <laughs> to be better, but uh, you know, I can I can use it pretty well in the spoken form anyway. All right. Good. <laughs> Okay, so in uh, Power and Presence, your new book, uh, you write that our souls 
have been colonized and our hearts and minds are deeply entangled in the current socio-industrial complex. Can you talk about that and explain what you what you mean by that? Yeah, well, I had to write something to sell the book, uh, so that was, seemed like a pretty good byline to me. Um, <laughs> no, but I, of course it reflects something that I think is, is, is happening. I can, you can argue about how deep that, that process goes into colonizing our minds and how much power we've given away. But um, essentially the, the argument that I put forward is that we spend now a lot of our time uh, interfacing with screens and, and technologies. And I don't know about in um, the US, but uh, in China, it's particularly uh, pronounced. People spend an enormous amount of their, their time staring at mobile technology. And of course, the more time you spend in the, what we might call the exteroceptive gaze, that means looking out from, from yourself out into the world, and the less time you spend looking in or noticing yourself, the more you lose connection with the body and with the spirit, because you know the, the body is deeply connected to the spirit in the present moment. Once you lose connection with the body, uh, then you become, well, by definition, disembodied, and it creates a kind of, kind of a trauma process besides anything else. And yeah, then we start to lose touch with who we really are. And of course, once um, your experience of the world is predominantly through through screens, then you know this, you know, what you see is not necessarily a function of free will or where you put your attention. It's increasingly about how the uh, uh, the people behind the screen uh, mediate your attention, uh, you know, according to their own, uh, technological technologies and, and softwares software so surveillance capitalism you might have heard of that term uh, by Shoshana Zubov is basically the idea that big tech companies uh, process our, our focus in order to optimize their own profits through advertising predominantly on, on the internet so it creates these echo chamber effects as one one aspect of it, and the, our feeds tend to they get these algorithms are getting better and better. I notice now, once you click on something or even pause on something, it'll just keep repeating it to you, and so it's very easy to get trapped into these um, uh, realities or meme spaces where maybe not we we have not really consciously chosen them, and uh, we're all multifaceted people. Uh, we're not. You know, simplistic people. We have we we grow and develop over time. We're supposed to anyway. So we don't want to be, get trapped into 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 these echo chambers or algor or or experience what I call algorithmic possession, where your your life is basically being mediated or controlled by um, by software rather than your own volition and losing losing touch with yourself as well. Yeah. So that's somewhat <clears throat> self self imposed, I suppose, and uh, then. But and then you enter the the world of uh, the the uh, corporate technologies and uh, but also governments, right? Uh, does the Chinese government try to use the internet uh, as a way of controlling people? Would you say? Oh, of course, yes. Yeah. Um, there's an interesting argument though, that which I'm I'm favorable to that uh, this kind of technocratic. Um, utilitarianism, if you want to call it, which is using technologies in order to get a, get better contr control of populations, um, is now just as developed in the West as it is in, in China. Mm -hmm. In China, they can't really control people as much as they used to because, you know, the, the revolution here in terms of, of people being able to access technology now is... is Pretty much as developed as it is in the West, of course, things are blocked and so on. But you know, there's ways to get around it. So you can't control people in China as readily, readily as you used to be able to. Like during the COVID epidemic, you may have seen there were um, some protests and even riots that broke out towards the end in the third year. Yeah. And um, well, you know, uh, the government couldn't really control those, and in the end, they were forced to respond to it. And that's one of the reasons why they. We assume they ended the um, the lockdowns in China. So yeah, in China, uh, there's definitely uh, control of the internet. I mean, I can't access Facebook or uh, or TikTok. Well, ironically, really, <laughs> TikTok, <laughs> TikTok. really, 
TikTok yeah. started in China is Chinese and you can't access it. Yeah, I guess it's the parent company. I'm not sure the, ex the exact way to define that relationship. But uh, yeah, they, in, in China, it's called Douyin, which is pretty much the same software, except that it's con more controlled by, and, uh, by the Chinese government and regulated in, in the Chinese sense, yeah. Why so not from, Facebook? So, what's that? Why, why can't you access Facebook? I don't understand what... Yeah, Facebook is blocked here. So you can't just click on, on, on the link to Facebook and open it up. Uh. So uh, it's the same with the most um, most West, like you, the, you know, Instagram is the same, and um, um, you know Reddit and, and all those. M most of them won't, won't open. So you have to use a, a VPN to mm. be able to access those things. Um, it's, you know, sometimes it works well, sometimes it doesn't. It can be a pain in the bum, as we <laughs> say in Australia, but um, you, you can get around it. I think the, the government tolerates that. What they're trying to do is just. Um, discourage people you know but if people really want to get those things you know they, they can do it you know. they can do it what about how does it, oh, oh yeah, Trish, go ahead, i was just gonna say what about the growth of uh these ai technologies like chat gbt and being mm. ai i mean do you see ai becoming setting us free or plunging us deeper into the abyss yeah well i did do a, a, a post on my uh my youtube channel about that a few months ago uh, it's a double-edged sword, as they say. Um, you know, I really think uh, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity with them and a lot of good things. And we just have to bring consciousness to what we're doing. Um, <clears throat> and with all this technology and any technology that's developed, there's always unexpected or unintended consequences to it. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to predict what they're going to be in the long run because the as other technologies, you know, develop around them or beyond them, uh, they could be used or manipulated in ways that we just don't know of right now. But, um, yeah, the, I mean, there's a whole heap of arguments about the good and bad things about these technologies. One of the great things is creativity and efficiency with creativity is really uh, enhanced by them, uh, I think. So you can create, you know, you can create music, um, even short videos. Soon you'll be able to make, create movies, you know, you can already create short videos. They're a bit clumsy right now, but almost certainly <laughs> over time, uh, your capacity to create things is going to be expanded massively as long as you want to invest a little bit of time into into using the technologies. And I guess the interface, you know, the user friendliness will also be improving. So I don't think it'll be too much of a digital divide there, except that some people may not have access to sure, computers. Sure. So do you, do you have access to Chat G, GPT and uh, Bing AI? Is that uh, um, yeah 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 I do. Um, uh, I have uh, a couple of apps on my phone, and they they utilize the the same software as uh, Chat GPT, and uh, and they they work on my phone without uh, my little iPhone my little iPhone here, without um, me using the the VPN. So, right. but I can not actually uh, open. The Chat GPT for OpenAI site, ironically, but it's exactly the same software. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, the basically the answer is yes. There's so many of these apps that use these technologies now. Yeah, uh, yeah I can use use them freely. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I you think have... it's interesting. I was just gonna say, I think it's interesting they let you go to YouTube. Yeah. It's not blocked. Yeah, it's blocked. Yes. Yeah, so. Oh, it is blocked. Okay. okay. But so LinkedIn. But LinkedIn is available too because that's where we've been communicating. No, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I have to use a VPN for for LinkedIn. I wish they'd they'd uh, maybe make that uh, that blocking a bit more powerful in LinkedIn's case. I find it a little bit of a painful <laughs> medium. But anyway, yeah. Uh, well, we're, I we're, use it. We're talking today from across the world, so that's yeah, you 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 yeah. can be quite useful. Yeah, yeah. So what what's the focus of your mind futures work? Well, at the moment, it's mostly to do with the kind of things we're talking about now, mm -hmm. um, the interface of technologies with human consciousness and also spirituality, and how that can be enhanced and or perhaps retarded by by these technologies. Um, mm -hmm. So that's really what I'm what I'm interested in in, in doing, and I'm helping with other people with it in the long run as well. And, now, your uh, students mostly Chinese? Yeah, they're all Chinese, yeah. They all, uh, mm. huh. Do you yeah, teach you... in Mandarin or English? No, or no I'm, I'm in an English language college. 
Uh, I just use a little bit of Chinese now and again. Uh -huh. uh, but Chinese isn't really good enough to to teach in 100% of the time anyway. But I guess if I had to do it, then I would have no choice. But uh, it's an English language international school. So, uh -huh. so the students are all Chinese. And, uh, you know, they use these technologies as well. Some of them don't use them. They're not encouraged in the education system. They're not overly discouraged either. But, you know, the, the policy hasn't really caught up with the technology, um, which is a bit mm -hmm. strange uh, because you think the Chinese government will be onto it. But um, I've not really heard much from my bosses about what we can and cannot use. It's still kind of ambiguous. So huh. I use them in my classes. I encourage the students to use them. I've told the bosses I'm going to use them. I'm teaching uh, future studies, foresight, um, how people can use these things responsibly the pros and cons of it. So that's what I'm going to do. And uh, nobody's uh, tried to stop me yet. <laughs> Haven't been do you have textbooks? Do you have textbooks? I really books? use yeah. textbooks, no. No, okay. So it's strictly yeah. it's strictly all coming from you. Yeah. I, I create uh, my own stuff, my uh -huh. own, my own uh, curriculum. There's so much stuff out there. And, and future studies is, is ongoing. Um, so everything changes. You know, last mm -hmm. uh, Last month, the system was things were different than this month. So, uh, you know, yeah. is is your book available in China? Um, well, it will be. It's being translated at the moment. The, the last one. Oh, cool. It does take a, right. a while though. It might be uh, six months before it's available in China. Yeah. Yeah. Well, do they have an Amazon in China? I mean, is it? Or yeah, how, how yeah. Basically, they do. Yeah. What's well, it? Taobao is it's called here. Uh, Amazon is Amazon. You know, used to be mainly books back in the day. Uh, and now it's pretty much modeled itself on, on Taobao, which was mm -hmm. the, the Chinese version with all the extras, you know, you can buy almost anything on there. Um, so China got the drift of this, uh, you know, non-retail, uh, retail, you know, you uh -huh. buy the internet. And I, know, I know it's taking off in many countries now, but in China, for this has been going for a long time. Mm -hmm. you know, my, my wife just buys all the stuff online now. <laughs> uh, hardly goes out. The retail is really suffering. The shops are, are really suffering. Uh, you know, that's in like in the world. states too. Yeah. What is that mm -hmm. called? Where it comes from? What's the, what's the company? Uh, Taobao. There's, the, oh. there's a number of them. Uh, Taobao is the main one. Oh, okay. Um, Tian Mao, another one, and uh, Tian Dong, I think. Uh, but anyway, this. <laughs> they're all delivered yeah. right to the door by trucks then. Yeah, that's right. They're mostly uh, by guys on motorcycles. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, really? On motorcycles? motorcycles. Uh, that's cool. Yeah. Town around town, creating chaos. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, also uh, it's not uh, great for the environment either with all these trucks around here. Uh, yeah, from, yeah, I guess. Amazon. Yeah, yeah. There is an environmental cost to doing stuff door to door. Yeah. Yeah. So um, back to your book. Um, you write that we are ensnared in a techno dystopia where the internet, politics, and society have been weaponized, uh, leaving our mm. souls defeated. Uh, so, is there any hope for us? <laughs> well, it's definitely hope. Yeah, that, that might be slightly hyperbolic. I'm, I'm pretty much an optimist <laughs> myself, but that does sound rather pessimistic. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, dystopia and utopia are rel relative terms. I mean, yeah. there's there's a lot of really wonderful things about society today. And I think we have such amazing opportunities as, as, as people that we should, ne we should not lose sight of, of that fact. Um, so I think that for me, at least, the, the positive far outweighs the negative. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, so many people have lived through human history without op the opportunities that we get, you know. That's true. Um, you look at our, our species Whenever you want to mark the beginning of Homo sapiens, it might be 100,000 years, or if you want to go back to other hominid species, it's maybe 3 million years. Most, most, most of them, our ancestors, like lived and died and had very harsh lives and, and were at the whim of forces that they had little control over, maybe some. And we have a lot more control over our lives and we live longer lives than these typical lives. I mean, um, going even back 200 years, I think, you know, 40% of children died before the age of five. If you visit wow. some old, cemet old, old cemeteries, you'll see how many, how many children's huh. graves are in cemeteries. It's quite 
stag. It must have been very hard to be a parent, you know, mm. in those days. We forget, you know, your mother. You might have had six, ten, twelve children, possibly. Hard. And yeah, it does seem extremely painful. My mother had eight, eight children. Wow. Yeah, it's right. a lot and, of um, kids. Yeah. Well, in my family, my one of my mother's children died before the age of three, and another one, another one died at twenty-one, wow. and uh, that was in modern times. Um, uh-huh. Yeah, because they mostly died from, I guess, from, uh, you know, immune immune problems, you know, diseases that, that weren't weren't vaccines. Um, hospitals may not have been readily available for for a lot of people. Uh-huh. Lives were tough. A lot of people were poor too uh, in agrarian society. So, you know, the local hospital wasn't necessarily there. Anyway, my point is, we shouldn't lose. We sometimes lose sight of the fact that we have a lot of wonderful things, and you know, gratitude is extremely important, even okay. when times are tough, and it actually actually helps you. Yeah. I know not everyone has a great life. I mean, I had a pretty difficult life when I was younger, and. Um, so I'm not uh, in any way trying to disrespect people who who have suffering, mm-hmm. uh, but if you look at the entirety of of the world and including the difficult places that people might be living in right now, it's probably considerably better than it once was, despite the fact that we have first world problems, you know, such as the cost of housing and things like this, which do place a lot of stress on people. Um, but, oh, that's true in China too. The cost oh, yeah. of housing. Oh, oh yeah, it is. Yeah, it's, it's become a real problem here. Uh, all around my town, where I live, you can see all these apartments. People, you know, um, in, people got rich here quite quickly after the nineteen eighties, nineteen nineties. That's not unusual for people to have had five apartments. You know, wow. The problem is that they keep building them. So then, when you want to sell the things, you, you can't get rid of them. You know? uh, yeah. <laughs> And they're still building all these new ones that are going up around town. What about the cost of food? Is that expensive? Um, yeah, yeah it's, been, it's been going up. There's a bit of inflation with food costs mm-hmm. as well, like fruit and vegetables. So I guess it's probably pretty similar to other Western countries. There's a um, an increase in inflation. It's not staggering, but it is it is noticeable here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think one of the advantages of the advanced uh, technology, especially the AI, is uh, saving a lot of time. I mean, uh, our the new book that uh, Trish mentioned uh, when she read the intro there about synchronicity. Mm-hmm. I was I I started working on the audio book and working with John, and I would we'd spend an hour and we'd stop and go, and it weren't you know it. it to do the first chapter, I think it took us three or four hours of you know <laughs> getting together. And then John discuss he can maybe tell us more about this, but he discovered a way of taking ten minutes of my I think it was just yeah, ten minutes of my voice. Oh yes. And mm-hmm. and and that almost instantly <laughs> was able to make the, the entire book. And ah. uh, is that yes, is, yes, this yeah, Isn't so that... I teach my kids about uh, some of this stuff, most of my, my <laughs> students as well. But I'm not, I've not actually used that technology, but um, yeah, that is one of the, I didn't realize that, you, that yeah, because there are, there are companies that sell that software, right? So um, including your own image as well, you can just plug it in and away you uh, go. And we, we, we won't. We won't plug any. We won't plug anybody on the podcast. But but uh, as far as you know, the company we're using that we used to uh, uh, start that process. But but the most the the amazing thing, and that's really where what we're calling AI, in my opinion, at this point, is really just generative AI. And it is it is amazing how it it really is amazing how um when just training, just getting enough uh, audio in there to you know, like you said, roughly mm-hmm. ten minutes of audio. And could and could and could train train the you know language model to yeah. even put his inflections into the mm-hmm. you know to the to the, the way uh, he uh, would pronounce words and and attack certain sentences and stuff. It was pretty amazing. Hmm. So you found the quality is pretty good. Oh yeah, it, re- it really is. I mean, yeah, old, it, Rob can speak. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. Sounds better than me, actually. You know, I mean, <laughs> I, I stumble a lot, and you know, it, no mistakes at all. You know, 
It's, Maybe uh, I should get that because it takes me a hell of a lot of time to do I to do the work oh, that I do, and I ran I ran out of time with uh, producing my um, recording, you know, recording some of my videos and blogs, and I'm trying to do a online course as well. So I might be able to use it. I never really thought of that. So uh, thanks for the tip. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, well, I'll send you. Yeah, I'll send you the link to the uh, to the okay. uh, serve to the service that we used. Uh, <laughs> course you know like you mentioned earlier in the uh in the in the podcast that uh you know it's 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 plugged into you know the it's it's using open ai framework but mm -hmm. uh but but yeah with a focus on with a specific focus on uh creating uh uh digital voices so yeah yeah did that book go up it hasn't yet and oh okay yeah, <laughs> we're, we're, we're still we're still still working on uh still working on finishing up uh and there it does make mistakes, Rob. You didn't mm -hmm. hear it. you. Well, actually, I think you did hear one. It it it, it will, oh, yeah yeah. It, there it, were a couple. It would ones, it yeah. would glitch every once in a while, but uh, it really was just going in and just copying like the the paragraph before and the paragraph after. Let it process that, and then could drop it in. It, but to to Rob's point, much faster than than uh, oh, it, 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 it's much faster than the but you know removing the. Uh, the time it took us to uh, to uh, get spooled up on uh, Zoom and read through chapters. Yeah, it would have cost uh, taken us maybe 25, 30 hours to do that. Uh, Jeez. Uh, I think more than that, but yeah. yeah you're probably right. <laughs> Entire yeah. week. The way we were going, <laughs> yeah, it would have. So, yeah. yeah, it's time consuming and tiring as well, even. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, um, go ahead, Trish. But I'm just wondering, what is digital wisdom, Marcus, and how do you create conscious relationships with these new technologies, or do you? Well, digital wisdom is just a framework I developed. In fact, I just finished writing a book chapter on it for for, for somebody. So the the original idea of digital wisdom, which really so dis, digital uh, literacy, which began in the 1990s, was mostly focusing on you know how to use technologies uh -huh. in in a smart way and being literate, um, and that eventually developed into there's a over time they added a few like social skills and how to mm. do teamwork with other people um on you know using these technologies but um i thought uh this is not quite a sufficient way to teach people it's not sufficient in itself i don't think so basically um my idea of digital literacy uh, wisdom has three three domains uh know the machines know the humans and know thyself. So know the machines is basically the, the original digital digital literacy. So you're trying to learn uh, some basic concepts about how, how um, technologies functions, function and how you can use them. You could argue about which skills or aptitudes you, you could learn. I would suggest mm -hmm. that people um, learn about how algorithms function at a practical level, not coding necessarily. Um, so that at least they understand the concept of uh, um, echo chambers or um, uh, what would you call it, uh, audience capture, mm -hmm. where creators tend to get captured by their audience and then find they can't really bust out of it because they get punished by the algorithm, these kind of things. <laughs> and um, uh, The concept of surveillance capitalism, how big tech employs these what I would call toxic pro profit models and uh, which cause problems, many of the problems that we know on the internet. Um, so let's uh, know the machines. Know the humans I, I, is the second part of digital wisdom, and I would say that is understanding essential human biology and cultures to, to the point where you can have a, an essential understanding of some of the common problems that we experience when we take this human anatomy and we put it into online systems, such as tribalism, for example, you know, how does that tend to function at a practical level? How can you spot when you are uh, part of a tribe and have allowed yourself to give your power away to it? That's kind of what I teach. Um, Sounds like brainwashing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah brainwashing, uh, suggestion, re repeated exposure. Uh -huh. two ideas, ways to um, be able to unplug from the algorithm, that are very basic ways, many, many sites where you can go incognito, for example, or just, uh, you know, um, 
and and use the cookies or whatever the correct term is. Um, uh, eat so, the cookies. <laughs> yeah, eat, eat the cookies. <laughs> so um, in your uh, okay, uh, in your work in, in your study of futurism, you use a couple of terms. Uh, like if you could talk about uh, what the difference between strategic foresight is and transformational foresight. Okay. Uh, first, I'll just mention the third part of digital wisdom, which is know thyself, which is the inner work part. Oh, right? okay. Yeah. So that's that's the basis of digital wisdom, actually. So this is where all the first person exploration comes in, mindfulness, meditation, um, perhaps dream work and journaling. Now, as, it, as for the difference between strategic foresight and um, transformational foresight, well, this is a debate that's going on in the, in the, in the foresight or future studies community. And it's uh, there is a bit of a culture class there. Well, strategic foresight basically means the futurist or the foresight practitioner will go and work with organizations at a, on the ground floor in a practical way. And so they may get caught up in the short-term uh, goals, like helping the, the company uh, optimize their, 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 their profits or their efficiency, uh, solve problems on the ground. Um, Trend analysis, these kind of things, so that the company can, you know, strategize for the future. Uh, but it may not be transformational in the sense that it may not encourage the company or the organization to think deeply about where they're going or what their role is in society, which is something that may not impact their immediate bottom line in terms of profits. But in the long run, it may, it may, uh, well, if they get if they, if they last long enough, it certainly will. And it's also important for um, us all, I think, to contribute to society. So um, transformational foresight is really sometimes called planetary foresight. It is um, keeping an eye on big pictures, uh, worldview, uh, paradigm challenging, mm -hmm. um, challenges narrative and mythology, looks at the deeper mythic levels of human evolution. Um, so it might challenge dominant Dominant science or dominant scientific paradigms, uh, such as the, you know, the mechanical machine metaphor, which tends to dominate science. Um, uh, it depends on the practitioner, but quite often it will be uh, moving towards deep, deep futures, which are long-term civilizational futures, not just immediate thinking about what's happening in the next ten years. Mm -hmm. Marcus, how do you see disinformation increasing through all this technology? Well, um, that's that's a bit of a minefield of disinformation. Um, it's uh, there, there, there are several different aspects to the uh -huh. problem. Um, it can be used even even everything can be weaponized, including the idea of disinformation. So this is where it becomes a bit tricky. Uh, who decides what is dis disinformation and not well, disinformation? Of course, is this deliberate deception, right? So, so if I tell you a lie, um, you know, there's and there's going to be a, uh, you know, um, I don't know, maybe if there's going to be the economy is going to collapse next month. I know, uh -huh. but inside information, I'm just trying to cause trouble. Um, that would be disinformation if I knew it wasn't correct. But if someone told me that, and I was really worried about it, and then. I decided to tell you it would just be misinformation because mm -hmm. I was just telling you something I misunderstood. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, ahead, but, no, but that's interesting. Uh, the way you, uh, the way you present that, because that, yeah, that that is. Is, that's kind of, that's kind of the, uh, that's kind of the uh, yelling fire in the theater. Yes. That's right. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, so in your, uh, future study of the future is of the future. Do you see a uh, possibility of China moving towards becoming a democracy? Any chance of that? Um, that's a good question. I haven't really thought about it too much. It's not really something that Chinese people think about a lot. Mm -hmm. and I think it's not really considered a priority here. But it's interesting with the problems that Western countries have had in the last uh, decade or so, or, you know. Yeah, it seems to be going the opposite direction towards yeah. democratic uh, rule. <laughs> yeah, there's um, less enthusiasm 
for Western cultures overall, I think, and, and democracy thing. Uh, so there's not really a lot of people pushing for it that I'm aware of. Huh. And, uh, in, but of course, there's, you know, it's difficult even if you wanted to, so it's hard to get a scope. But my sense is that I speak to a lot of Chinese people and almost nobody talks about it, really. Hmm. It's not really something that is a priority. You, know, you have to remember China... Um, traditionally, is not not a democratic society. It was a, basically a, a kingdom um, okay. um, for you know for thousands of years, and the idea was that the emperor was at the top of the chain, um, mm. and uh, the emperor was supposed to uh, initiate on the the mandate of heaven. So there was supposed to be like a, the you know to be a voice of, of the divine on the earth in theory. And uh, and then the, the people below, you know, the different classes within the society, which would include the the scholars and the, uh, I guess the, 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 the military and then down through society was, would f- fall into their place in society and that's how it would function. And so they had the concept of Hershia, her which is harmony. And... Um, so the idea is that people operate in harmony with each other, and uh, that's where the, you know, the, the Tai Chi movements come in, where people mm-hmm. are doing the things together. Mm-hmm. So there's more of a, co- a collectiveness there. Um, yeah. Of course, when things, you know, when the stuff hits the fan, people do revolt <laughs> in China. There's plenty of examples of uh, people yeah. revolting. Um, uh, you had mentioned the you had mentioned the one uh, in COVID. They were people yeah. around the streets, and then also yeah. Tiananmen Square seemed like a window to yeah. uh, change. Uh, that was a long time ago. It was yeah. shut, <laughs> shut down very quickly, but yeah, that was more, more of a violent uh, uprising and put down. So, um, for Chinese history, though, there have been quite quite a few such things. Uh, for example, in the 1870s, 1890s, there was a, a huge uh, revolt called the Taiping Rebellion. And uh, basically there was, and this is one of the reasons why the Chinese government is a bit wary of, of, of revolts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I forgot the name of the guy, but uh, he, he said he was the reincarnation of Jesus Christ's brother. And, huh. and, he, and he, re- he led a rebellion In in China, I mean, like people use the I Ching with clients, or I believe. I, I uh... hey, hey, real quick, guys. Sorry, but uh, but I I am uh, I just had two freezes on my end, so I completely missed whatever you guys were saying for like the last almost minute. Oh, okay. So if it, yeah, so just so, but yeah, I'm hope. As far as I can tell, still got connectivity, but uh, so I'm, but yeah, on my end, it just, I lost audio okay. and everything. So, anyway, okay. so if y'all just wherever you, or if Trish, we're if talking you about repeat, divination. If, yeah, if you can repeat <laughs> your question and then yeah, I'll edit, that. I'll edit this out. But yeah, yeah. let's go okay. from there. Yeah. 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 I was just asking Marcus if there's any kind of fortune telling, if people use the I Ching or read cards for other clients, that kind of thing. Yeah. The I Ching is used a lot in business, I understand. That uh, a lot of business people will will use it when they're deciding who to work with, for example. Uh, um, hmm. I've never actually seen that, but I believe that it's true, and I've spoken to people who who say that it's it's true. So I have no reason uh, to doubt it. I'm just not there when they're when they're doing it. Um, so, <laughs> well, Marcus, you need to go. You need to go get rid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe I should, maybe I should monetize that. <laughs> But as for more, uh, what you would think of like a, an intuitive, uh, because uh, you know the, the I Ching has a system of, of runes or whatever it is that right. they use. Um, when... It's not quite the same thing as someone using. Well, you know, tarot cards. There are different processes. A lot of people use tarot cards use their intuition to do a reading uh-huh. around when they when they interpret the cards right. And some people are extremely accurate with tarot cards. Uh-huh. Yeah, you know, 
people do use um, tarot cards. In Hong Kong, I've, I know people who are tarot card readings, do tarot card readings. And there's some new age centers, I guess you would call them that, book centers in, in Hong Kong. You can go there. I know a woman there who has one. So people, um, yeah, a lot of Chinese people are interested in those things, especially when the economy is bad. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> kind of normal. <laughs> um, yeah, so... Uh, is is intuition is definitely definitely this is going on here? Yeah, is intuition a part of uh, futurism? Uh, using these in, intuitive skills? Not norm, not normally in in yeah. formal in in formal foresight. Mm -hmm. um, however, uh, there are there are futurists that talk about it and say it's important. In 2015, for the Journal of Future Studies, for example, I I wrote an article with five other futurists about basically about intuitive uh -huh. uh, aspects uh -huh. and uh, foresight. You can find you can still find that online if you like. And one of the uh, one of the articles was written by Barbara Marx Hubbard. You may have heard of her. Yes. She's a biologist. Oh, yeah. And she was. She was married to Hubbard, right? She uh, she died not long after, but uh, unfortunately. But um, yeah, so it's not normally a part of for future stuff. But when I go to conferences and I've talked about integrated intelligence a lot at conferences, never had a problem with it uh, because futurists that hang around in my circles and including in Asia, they're they're very open people because futurists are pretty weird anyway, right? So <laughs> my weirdness is just one weirdness amongst amongst many. <laughs> Many people are open, so, yeah. open to these kind of things. Yeah, and you call it integrated intelligence. Is that the term you use for? Yeah, that's just a term that I developed early on, which is just to, just to suggest that we're drawing in information all the time, and we can bring it into consciousness or, or access it deliberately, and then use it for decision making in relationships, um, and mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were seven seven aspects to uh, to to integrated intelligence, if I can remember them all. Um, so foresight or, or four senses, I call it as one, is, is, is intuiting futures as they mm. unfold. And the uh, other one is, is synthesis, synthesizing information, drawing information, getting a sense of how things uh, fit together. And um, uh, inspiration as well as another one, or creativity. And uh, I'm just trying to remember the other ones. That <laughs> how about location? Secret? How about synchronicity? What's that? How about synchronicity? Well, it's not a formal part of uh, of what I what I included in there, but uh, I guess synchronicity is is paying attention to to what is happening in the world in terms of its symbolism. Uh -huh. But I didn't formally include that in in the in the um, uh, theory or the, uh, that framework. Yeah, yeah. but uh, I've written a bit, about, a bit about synchronicity here and there because, yeah, as, as you mentioned, my my book, um, Discovery of a Soul Template, was originally called Sage of Synchronicity until they asked me to change it. I think my name was better, but anyway. <laughs> Who asked you to change it? The editor? Oh, the company, um, yeah. Inner, Inner Traditions. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, I like, I, think those, I like the Sage of Synchronicity. Yeah, uh, I do too. Yeah. But um, there, were, there were some, those Discover, there were some of the Discover books around at that time that were doing well, it was Discover something or other. So anyway, they decided to to go with uh, this guy. Uh, and say, so, okay, why not? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll we will repurpose that. That'll be the name of the episode. So uh, this episode <laughs> will be Sage of Synchronicity. For yes, I like that. <laughs> hey, that's that's a good one. Okay, maybe the copyrights run out for them. I don't know. Maybe I can <laughs> I can steal it back. <laughs> yeah, right. Do you have yeah, that's syn a good... synchronicities in your life? I oh, agree yeah, quite a lot. Yeah, I mean, synchronicity really is, I think, the interface of consciousness and, and cosmos or self and, and, and the world. And, um, you know, I've written about a few of them. You might remember the one about uh, Anita Mujani. Did you remember that one I told about her, the woman who wrote Dying to Be Me? Oh, vaguely. Yeah, I, I vaguely recall. Tell it again. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah it was a pretty good one. Yes, it was. Yeah. Um, when I was in Hong Kong, it was around about, around about 2011, I think, and uh, I was in a bookshop in Hong Kong and uh, at the IFC, which is a big a big building. You don't need to know that. And, and uh, I had this 
bookshelf out the front with all the old books they were trying to get rid of, rid of cheap. And I stumbled across uh, Anita's book, uh, Dying to Be Mean. You know, one of these things like that, that, you know, it was like I was drawn to it and I picked it up and <clears throat> it really resonated with me. And I thought, you know, um, I got a feeling I'm going to meet this woman. You know, I had a really strong feeling of connectedness with her. And so I went, I went, and I and I looked at the book, and I and I, I I learned from the book that she actually lived in Hong Kong somewhere, and I didn't know, I didn't, you know, the seven million people in Hong Kong. And <laughs> anyway, anyway, I was on on the train going back and reading the book, and I was I just felt that she was somewhere somewhere near me, I could feel it. But I looked around, you couldn't couldn't see her. There's a little picture of her on the, on the back cover on the, on the back cover, right? And, but I went went home, and um, I went out with my friends that night, and they, and we we're going to go to a restaurant to eat, and then one of them said, "Let's go to the Indian restaurant," because you know Anita is uh, Indian of by descent. And I thought that's interesting synchronicity as well. So we went along, but she wasn't she wasn't there. But I went home, and the next morning I woke up. I went to the coffee shop where I lived in Discovery Bay, which is an island off off the coast, basically on an island off the coast of Hong Kong. And I was sitting there, and I was doing some work, actually writing. And I was, and I had the book beside me, and there was uh, some people sitting in the in the table in front of me, you know, and uh, and I could look at them. And they looked they looked Indian, and the woman who was sitting beside be up to a, with a back towards me. I was looking at that looks a bit like Anita, you know. <laughs> and I was looking at the looking at the the picture on the back, and I think that's her. There's like a little mole here, I think, you know. <laughs> I thought no, no, I could I couldn't be. You know? So I went back to. Um, to my work, I didn't. Have, I mean, I'm a terrible introvert. And then, as I was working, suddenly the, I looked up and this this guy, actually named, named Danny, was there saying, "Is that book? Is that a good book?" I said, "Yeah." And I said, "Is that a need?" He said, "Yeah, it is. You come and have a talk." Wow, <laughs> that is great. <laughs> and uh, so I ended up talking to her, and uh, uh, yeah, so that was really a really wonderful synchronicity. And she said, she said that these kind of things have happened a lot. Yeah. yeah, but it didn't end there as well. Actually, that night, I had this dream where I saw the the front of my blog has a picture of a guy standing above the Earth from a spaceship, and I had this dream where I saw this this image on the front of my blog, and um, it, this guy was standing there, and there was like a uh, what would you call it, an indicator which was, which was indicating some sort of clock. So when I woke up and I remembered it, that, that, I think I think that means that I'm going to get a lot of hits on my blog today. And because uh, I only normally got a few, a few, and then I went to my blog and I had like two thousand hits already on my blog. Wow. And oh. uh, and I I worked out that so I, so I contacted Anita and I said, did you did you uh, put did you did you tell you tell anyone about our, our connection? And she had, but the interesting thing is she, thing is she didn't tell anybody um, for several hours after I had the dream. Huh. So. Uh, I had the dream before she told anyone. So it had a ah, precognitive. Precognitive. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So um, I get lots of dreams like that. I get lots of precognitive dreams. Yeah. We should ask you about the U.S. election. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, um, I, I'm, I'm, I try to stay away. Though. I get kind of annoyed by politics. I, and I'm not American. Mm-hmm. But I did, I did see... Uh, Something two days before, I saw um, an image appear of, um, uh, of Kamala Harris, mm-hmm. and then, then her name was written over the picture, and it was fading. Then the, the name was fading into, into light um, pencil, and my sense of that was that that she's going to fade fade away in, in terms of the, the election. So, uh, I, I mean, that was my interpretation at the time. Huh. I mean, I've been wrong before, but uh, yeah, that was. Yeah. Um, that's, that's basically what happened. Yeah. Uh, interesting. So mm-hmm. do you do uh, personal counseling, don't you, as a life coach? Uh, could you talk a bit about uh, what that involves and the type of clients you have? Yeah. I haven't been doing it a lot recently, but I, I've done a lot over the years, both in person and online. So <clears throat> it depends on what the, what the person wants. I can teach people about intuitive intelligence and how to develop their in- integrated intelligence. Um, a lot of the time I work with people on uh, inner child work, 
or healing work as well, because I've done a lot of healing work. I'm not just an intellectual. Um, I work a lot with the emotional body. Um, so that also gives me a bit of a, a gift, if you like, to be able to see into people's uh, energy field, or mm. including trauma and emotional problems and some of the energy connections with other people. And through that, you, I can uh, unravel, if you like, or, or narratives, or soul, soul stories, really, that people have. Because our soul stories tend to tend to repeat themselves until we bring them into consciousness. Uh, and and after, from life to life, you talking yeah, about life to life, or even within even within one Unlocked. lifetime, you can repeat the same story. You know, um, or, because our stories are multi are multifaceted. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are big big stories, and then there are small stories um, within them. Yeah. Uh, meta stories and. And, and minor stories, huh. yeah. So they can they can repeat, and you know, even people who have a lot of awareness can repeat them unconsciously. I mean, life is, you know, the journey isn't easy sometimes. So, uh, you know, I've repeated some some mistakes that I've made in the past. Although, I'm certainly glad that I developed the insights that I have because you know, uh, I really needed to be able to apply these kind of things directly in order to be able to live any kind of normal life. So it's been pretty helpful for me. So, so, so real quick, you know, but yeah, that's, uh, once again, something you just said really triggered, uh, triggered a thought, but, uh, yeah, I kind of wonder if maybe, uh, because, well, and we don't have time to go into, uh, probably, and maybe it wouldn't even be a discussion, but into, uh, AI as a marketing term, because, but uh, but maybe that's what it should be called right now is I, I intuitive intelligence huh. because that's yeah. really kind of what it does yeah. for us right now is kind of collect those signals and give us some insight maybe where things are headed. So just a thought. Hmm. Yeah, can act, can act as certainly as a as a, a tutor or a, or a mentor in that way. Um, so it can be very useful in many ways, and you can also there are multiple ways that you can use it to enhance a spiritual journey. Uh, if you look at some of the dreams that I had, I actually rendered them through AI um, you know, imagery and put them on my um, them on my YouTube channel. So some of the images from my dreams, I, I I literally created them and put them so you can share the dream more vividly huh. and show people when it happens. That's one way that you can do it. And um, uh, and what was the question? I've kind of gotten off track here. So <laughs> yeah, I think uh, oh, yeah. One yeah. one point I would make is that is it. Uh, the more you rely on the technologies, though, there's a, you may undermine your own intuitive ability if you over rely on them. So I think it's important to to keep working on yourself and keep an eye on yourself. And but you can as you get intuitions, you can test them through the technologies. Uh, uh, if I, for example, if you get a, an intuition about moving somewhere, well, then you can just go to the machine and and see if your sense of what that place is is correct or not. And uh, um, there are multiple ways that you can explore intuitions using these technologies. Huh. You can test test them. I, I think <clears throat> test intuitions. You know, that's yeah. one of the ways that you can get feedback from from but the is, world. But isn't there also a, sometimes a delusional aspect to uh, uh, in, intuition? And you, I'm, I'm referring what do you mean to delusional. Well, okay, I'm referring to an interview we did with you 12 years ago, and you were talking about. Your uh, your work with uh, personal counseling as a life coach, mm -hmm. you had a you had a woman who had a very high opinion of herself that she was some kind of advanced being, and she was kind of frustrated that things weren't working out as it should for an advanced being. And other people had apparently told her that she was this advanced yeah. being, and uh, you. You saw this that she was living in this delusion. Do you, do you remember that uh, at all? That uh, particular, I don't remember that. But but you know, that story is it's really just the nature of the ego, right? So it's not uh, yeah something particularly right. unusual. And some people may get a bit carried away, um, but we're all like that to some degree. We develop um, false perceptions of ourselves, and then we may uh, stumble through the world until such time as we see that they're, they're not true or there's some problem with it. But with um, like the, what I would call the, you know, the Christ complex, basically, or this 
which is the spiritual, the spiritual ego, which is a very common thing. And I think all spiritual practitioners probably experience it to some degree, and believing that we're, we're we're better than other people, or have some special mission. We might, we might have a special mission, by the way, but um, it's important that we bring awareness to how we may use it as a compensation for our own sense of inadequacy instead of working on the part of ourselves which is wounded and feels diminished. Because then you can cause problems for other people if you, if you don't address that. Yeah, and 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 wouldn't wouldn't that wouldn't that be part? And that would be testing your intuition, uh, whether mm -hmm. whether it's whether it's using the technology or stepping outside the technology, especially. Well, stepping outside the bubble, whatever your whatever your bubble may be, group of people that you have around you, some social some social network group, whatever it is, uh, stepping outside that and seeing if you're seeing if uh, seeing if reality matches up, right? Yeah, I guess the original question was about intuition. So here, I guess sure. it's a mm -hmm. sense, sense of themselves. Um, uh, yeah, so you know, you, you get organizations, and you know, because which get together and give people power, and so you end up with a cult-like situation. Um, this is very common in in spiritual groups. Uh, it's not unusual. So people in these groups, but you know, you learn, you learn from it if you experience it. Lots of people have this experience, and they and they realized, okay, I gave my power away to somebody. Hopefully, it's not Tim Jones or someone like that. Yeah. Hopefully, it's just it's an ego fall, right? Eventually, the ego builds itself up; it can't sustain itself. Yeah, so that's what he falls. That's what you had said in that interview that uh, this woman would eventually have uh, a fall uh, recognizing the delusion and the, the the bigger the delusion, the greater the fall. But you also said there's advantages there. Uh, there's an upside that you discover your authentic self uh, when you when you get past the delusion. Yeah, it's potentially potentially true. So ego falls are not a bad thing as long as you as long as you take the fall right. <laughs> and, uh, uh, if you don't take the fall, then you can end up creating chaos, or you know, going to self self destruction. Um, so ego falls. You know, people and groups have ego falls. You know, um, yeah. nations have ego falls. So it's a, it's a part of uh, yeah. but the how story we will repeat itself, and then there will be a collapse. And if they don't learn from it, they'll, they'll build the story again, and then it will collapse. So you go through a cycle of. Ego falls and building the ego and then falling. So ideally, you learn from it so that you actually evolve or develop and expand the the light of the self, not the ego. Yeah, so there's a distinction a distinction there. So that we're in a world that's dominated by external fluences, and uh, so how do we discover this uh, inner self or the authentic self when we have all these uh, things coming at us? We just got to make it a priority, right? To to spend time every day. I, I spend time every day. I usually start off in the morning every day. I'm um, doing a meditation. Quite often, it's a, it's an emotional uh, process as well. If I feel any energy moving through me that might be to do with my personal trauma, for example, I may give it a voice. Uh, if it's anger, I may just you know bang a pillow for a little bit, just give it a voice and listen to what it's saying, and then assume responsibility for it. This is part of in is it part of inner child work for me? That's that's one of the ways that I do it. So mindfulness for me is not it's not just um, attention to the body, but it's also bringing attention to the the emotional body as well. So having a conscious relationship with um, with the feelings because the feelings then lead into the stories. Because mm -hmm. the feeling if there's anger, there's usually a story behind it. You know, like nobody loves me or nobody's listening to me. They always betray me, whatever, whatever it is. So the once you go into the anger, the story will arise, and then you can then you can reparent yourself as you see the story and and the and the beliefs that are associated with it. So that's what I do. I bring consciousness. I make time almost every day for that. If you don't make the time, yeah, then sure. If the first thing you do when you get up in the morning is turn your phone on and <laughs> play with it three hours, then you will be lost. I don't think there's anything that is more certain than if you went on to um, 
you know, some some of these social media platforms and started arguing with people at <clears throat> six o'clock in the morning. <laughs> well, you kiss your life goodbye, basically. <laughs> but there's a lot of people that do that, you know. Yeah. A lot of people that can't can't seem to separate themselves from the technology. So you just got to discipline yourself. Say, All right, I'm not going to turn the damn thing on for the first three hours. And that's that. You know, that's what I do. Hmm, that's cool. Marcus, what does the word on your shirt mean? Mizum? My... I have no idea. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm just curious. I keep seeing it. Well, I bought this in Thailand. So, uh, oh, okay. Um, oh, okay. It's probably just the name of it. Of a, could be the name of a, a sporting company or. I thought maybe um, it was a, you know, some type of saying that relates to what you're talking about. <laughs> and, and just real quick, just so we don't take up. A... A whole lot more of Marcus's time. We did we did start thirty minutes early, so we right. may be yeah. at that point where we need to wrap up. Just don't want to. You don't want to. Don't want to monopolize your time. Yeah, and for you. Sure. It's getting. It's pretty late for you, right? Yeah. It's okay. Good bit more time, but uh, yeah. If you want to talk a bit about something else, or wrap it up. Both are okay yeah. by me. Yeah. Um. Can you talk? Uh. Question. Can you talk freely about consciousness and spiritual development at your college? Uh, and in, uh, and in China in general, is there? Well, I think in China, in China in general, it's not such a big problem. Um, as long as yeah, they've loosened up the the culture of, uh, of spirituality here, and I think especially if you frame it through the Chinese history, through Taoism and Buddhism, uh -huh. it's normally okay. Uh, they do get a bit a bit antsy with people who get huge followings. Um, like there was a guy who had a, a company called Crazy English. I can't remember <laughs> his name, but he'd get all, he'd have these huge arenas full of people. And they'd be chanting um, sayings in English, and uh, they they got a bit scared of him, so they shut him down. Mm. That was about ten years ago. Uh, so they can they can do that, but you know. I've I've been in groups here in China with people, uh, hundreds of hundreds of people, and some people even start talking about like the Cultural Revolution and things like this, which are forbidden, and nobody uh, nobody got hauled away. Yeah, but you, you know you got to keep an eye on these things. Um, one of my teachers actually moved his moved his business to, to Thailand from from, from China because he was a bit worried about it. He, you know, he hadn't been here since before COVID. I told him, I think it's okay what you do. He just does mindfulness. And he worked in Beijing before. I, I was with him and he did a pretty good job and they, nobody cared. So I think it's okay. Intuition in my classrooms. Um, I do do, I, I've got a bit more courageous with that in, in recent times. I do talk about more about personal development. I don't normally use the word spirituality, but yeah, sometimes I do. And I talk about integrated intelligence as well. I talked about that, and I try to frame it in the in the, the Chinese sense. You know, I even got the students a couple of times to do um, to test their ability to uh, to use their intuition. You know, Rupert Sheldrake's telephone experiment, for example. Right. Telephone. That's a good one. Uh -huh. So I got I got I got the students to get into groups of five, and one person you know, will call. Call the other people. Have to pick up the pick up the phone, and try to guess which of the other four is, is calling them, and use a random a, a random uh, uh, number generator <clears throat> to to do that. That's just this fine. I tell them it's just just fun, you know. Just see what you think. I'm not telling you what's right and wrong, and they they, they like it. They they really like doing that. And so far, I haven't I haven't been hauled away. <laughs> Sounds good. So, or because I'm curious, are, are, do a lot of people have pets? In China, yeah, like yeah, dogs and cats, and yeah, they, there's a lot of pets here. Yeah, in fact, um, we've got four cats, four cats, and there's a whole bunch, whole bunch of them in the compound, and uh, we feed some of them. So there's an, another like three or four outside that are basically ours that, that are free out there, but they come back every day and and uh, give them food. Huh. Yeah, but you know, there's there's but there's been some issues with. Uh, in some in some parts of China, some of the local governments, you know, like during COVID, apparently were rounding up pets. And uh, anyway, if they had come for my pets, the, you know, there would have been a, a showdown. I can tell you. <laughs> yeah. So one That's final sure. question, 
question uh, here, Marcus. Um, do you have uh, spiritual guidance uh, in your work and life? And uh, if so, how how do you how do you how do you get it? I mean, a team. You, yeah, yeah, like a team. Are you in? How are you in? Are you in touch? Or? I mean, with like spiritual guide, you mean? Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do. I don't necessarily know them by name, but I am in a continual state of prayerfulness, as I call it. Mm-hmm. Uh, over the years, I have had visitations from what appear to be spirit guides. Yeah. Um, and even to the point where I could, but usually when in like a, a deep meditative state, I have not, not actually seen one in like a pew at my, you know, at the kitchen table or yeah. something like that. But I regularly get. ETs? What's that? Any ETs. contact with the ETs? I used to have some con- connectedness, it seemed. Uh, yeah, I remember that you we talked yeah. about that years ago. Uh, you you had yeah. some experience. Uh, what about in China? Are are there UFOs sighted in China? Is that is that a thing there? Yeah, kind of. There's not not too many sightings. There's a lot of people are interested in in them though. So um, there's people a sp- get a, people get abducted. Are there Chinese <laughs> abduction stories? I've not heard of any ab- abductions in 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 China. To be honest. Yeah, I've not heard of that, but uh, there's definitely people interested in UFO culture here. So, yeah. someone guy gave me a book in in Beijing about that. So, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Where can people find your book? Uh, in your website? Uh, not through my website at the moment, but just uh, on Amazon dot Amazon uh, Amazon Amazon dot com, of course. Uh, so all my books are available there. Most of them are in uh, hard copy as well as as Kindle format. Some of them are, most of them are self-published. Some of them are published through publishers. But uh, Power of Presence is is available in uh, uh, hard hard copy and also uh, uh, a Kindle Kindle version. So yeah, okay. Amazon would be the best place to go to get it. Right, and maybe you can get it. Out in audio too, uh, using this new method. Yeah, yeah. So how about, yeah, I'll push. I'll push a link to that service to Rob, and he can uh, yeah, push, cool. send it on to forward it on to you, um, and we'll put a link in the description uh, to your uh, to your to the new book. And uh, one last thing, this is completely out of left field, uh, and I, that's probably not considered, probably would not rate as a synchronicity at all, but. Um, I used to have a blog and I actually still own the domain and it, it was uh, fuzzyintuition.com. I still <laughs> own that. Intuition. And 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 fuzzy intuition was specific it was, you know, it was a slant, kind of a slant on uh, fuzzy logic. So fuzzyintuition.com mm-hmm. still own still own that domain. Haven't done with it anything with it in a long time, but we talked so much about intuition. I just thought I'd mention that. So. <laughs> fuzzy <laughs> intuition. That's good, John. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, intuition is is fuzzy. It is a fuzzy intelligence. Uh-huh. I think you alluded to that. It can be you, know, you. You can get distortions of intuition, which is very, very true. So you've got to practice it and develop it, and and keep an eye out for those distortions. So that's mm-hmm. a very important part of developing a human intuition. Great talking to you again. Yeah, this is Marcus. fun, Marcus. Yeah. You're out. Yeah, great. Yeah, good to um. <clears throat> last time wasn't it? Didn't we just do it through? Did we do it on video last time, or was it just? No, no, no. no it was this just sound. The first, this is the first time we've actually yeah. talked. Yeah. You know, uh, it's yeah. always been, uh, you know, through, through, through the digital world. Yeah, I couldn't remember doing the video part, so usually that means uh, that we didn't do it. <laughs> yeah, we did. yeah. <laughs> Not always. Sometimes I just forget. Yeah. Well, okay. take care, and this has been great. Thank you so much. And John, when's it going to go up? Um. Man, I hate, uh, we got, uh, I, I believe two weeks from today. I okay. believe. Yeah, we'll okay. send you the link. Yeah. We'll send you a link. Yeah. Thanks, uh, John, Trish, and Rob. I really enjoyed talking to you. And uh, I'll, hey. I'll keep an eye out for your blog as well. Um, where, where is it? Themysticalunderground.com. Uh, don't have a, like a YouTube channel or something like that, just the blog? Now this it's called the mystical underground the YouTube yeah well and and and, well, and, and yeah on, on on the mist on on yeah it's YouTube slash at the mystical underground on YouTube yeah okay I'll definitely uh, check yeah. that sorry I didn't yep. uh, I've been quite busy lately so yeah. <laughs> <I know. laughs>
know the feeling <laughs> for sure. Mm-hmm. It's uh, it's uh, yeah. Uh, anyways, but but yeah, thanks for thanks for coming on. Awesome yeah, thank conversation. You. Right, we'll, we'll be in thanks, touch. everyone. Yeah. See you later. Take yeah. care. Right Have a good day. <laughs> Sorry, Mike. Thank you. Thanks for joining the Mystical Underground. Visit www.themysticalunderground.com for the latest blog post and book info. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, or your favorite podcast app. Listen to the podcast at podcast.themysticalunderground.com. Follow Trish and Rob on Instagram at Trish and Rob McGregor. Follow us on Twitter at The Mystic Cast. Send email to podcast at themysticalunderground.com. And until next week, thank you for listening and stay mystical. Yeah.